All right. Real quick, uh, it's been my joy once again to be traveling a lot throughout Africa as the Africa Field Director for BIMI. We right now have 129 missionaries throughout Africa in 25 countries. And what I do is, I, as I shared with you with my last presentation that I did, that was mostly to our national ministries. This was the former ministries that we worked with and we helped to start. And many of them have continued on to plant churches now. And they planted three more churches this past year. I've got some new updated pictures I'll eventually show you later on. Uh, we're finishing a big stone building right now for one of our churches that have been in, going on for 15 years. And they were just able to get property and get some things going. And I'm helping them to finish up their stone building there right now. And we just had another new church plant. It's a, we just built a huge, big mud hut. I mean, it's huge. Um, and uh, we have 85 last Sunday brand new church plant. This is a wonderful thing. It's where two tribes have always warred together. And, uh, and this is a church that's located in the old battlefield. And um, there are, they, they have been arch enemies for many years, and we've been able to establish one Bible study, and then eventually this is now going to be another church. And so praise the Lord for that. But this trip was completely for our missionaries. So just to give, give you a little bit of an idea, of course, Africa it's huge, and uh, what we've done is that you can see how we've kind of subdivided Africa into different categories, the north, east, west, central, and then south. I spent our entire time in the east section over here. This is now all of the countries there in East Africa. Nearly 40% of all of our missionaries with BIMI, and by the way, we, we're, we have the largest footprint in Africa of any of the independent Baptist mission boards. So we just, it's, we have a good footprint there throughout there. About 40% of them are in East Africa. So every January, I have a field conference for all of our missionaries in East Africa. And uh, they all come together. And uh, the majority of them are in Uganda. So we, fo so we focus our, our time there in Uganda. And so we had a wonderful time there. Um, so uh, just to give you a little bit of an idea of what we do to get there. Some of you are asking me this morning, what are your trips? How do you go there? So basically, we go from Chattanooga to Atlanta and then over to Amsterdam. All right. And then down to Tanzania and then over to Uganda. All right. So takes about a couple days to get there. But uh, once we got there, uh, this is some of the things that we did. Uh, we were trying to be able to focus in visiting all of our first-term missionaries. And um, we have right now a lot of first-term people throughout Africa. And when you have them in multiple different countries, sometimes that's a challenge to be able to get to them during their first term. But we tried to do that. We were able to visit uh, five of our different new families this time. Um, and so what we did is we flew up from Entebbe, to uh, and uh, went up to Kampala and then over to Masaka. And we were visiting now with uh, one of our new church families there. They're doing working on Bible translation there right now. And then from there over to the border of Congo. And we have two new families there. And uh, so it was wonderful to be able to visit with them uh, together with some of the new ones there in the Kampala area up to Fort Portal. Uh, that's where it's going to be a, another new missionary, new family is going to be transitioning there and then back to Kampala. And then while we were there, all of our missionaries came in and we had our field conference. One of the churches that we were with there in Kasese, over by the border there of Congo, was the Buford family. And uh, this is a wonderful family. They are Navajo, both of them. One to Christ from the reservation. And uh, I was able to be part of uh, his ordination and uh, over there in New Mexico and be able to spend time with his family and uh, both of their families. It's a wonderful family here. And uh, they have been on the field for two years and they were just able to charter now their new church. So that was kind of special. I preached for them th that morning and then a couple churches all came in uh, to join the festivities. Can you imagine transporting to church over an hour on the back of that thing? Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> and, uh, and the roads aren't smooth either. Okay? So hold on quick. And uh, 
So from there, um, we had our chartering service. We had about 150 people total from several different churches there uh, just to encourage the new church. And uh, I preached there and um, had 16 charter members for that Sunday. So that was, that was really kind of special. And from there, we visited several of our missionaries as we traveled around that little loop there. And uh, Laura and I had five suitcases full of stuff. And we love spoiling our missionaries. We are uncle and aunt to all of the missionary kids. And because of her age, we're starting to get to the grandparent stage, but we don't want to go to that too far. Um, but uh, we just love our missionary kids and we invest in them and we take uh, gifts and do as much as we can to be able to spend time and enjoy our time with each family. Um, just a couple, couple pictures here. And um, we were able to get new BIMI logo hats for, for them. And uh, some of the younger children stole them from their parents. And uh, Erica, our daughter, was able to fly over from Kenya to be part of the field conference there. And uh, she has a special ministry there also with the missionary kids that are teenagers. And uh, since she grew up there. And, um, and she's able to be able to minister there a little bit. And it's a, it's a joy to be able to see her interacting with all of them and answering a lot of questions about growing up on the mission field. And then the next step of what they do after that. Yeah. And um, so praise the Lord. And so then we just, just a wonderful time of preaching. We had three days uh, where uh, I had a guest pastor come in and he is the sending pastor of two of our missionaries there in East Africa. So he came and he preached to us there and I preached and, uh, and then <clears throat> my wife preached. Um, she, she held a couple ladies meetings there. And uh, also we had a special time when we honored one of our missionary families. This was their 25th year on the mission field. And so this is Matt and Keila Stensis, and we award them. We have BIMI, we have uh, BIMI pins that we, they get when they are approved. And uh, they get silver ones uh, when they hit 25 year. And yes, we do give gold ones for the 50th. And uh, there are a few that have made that. And I've had the privilege of giving two of those to some of our missionaries. And like I said, my wife was nice and quiet, but she can preach. And so, uh, but she has helped with, she's been a great blessing to our ladies there. And she teaches us, we had a split sessions there where she's able to teach the ladies on uh, issues on the field and, and be a blessing to him. Them. This was the group that we had there for the field conference. And uh, once we left there, we flew over to Kenya to be able to spend time with someone special. Yeah. And um, now, <clears throat> now we did go to Kenya, not just to see Erica. We did have a new family there. And we was able to spend some time with them and one of our veterans. Uh, and then I took my director hat off and took my daddy hat on, and I was able to have a wonderful time with our daughter there, and she's got a wonderful ministry. She's been there now a couple years. She's preparing to come back on, on her first furlough for six months at the end of this year, and so we're looking forward to her being back here. She's, she helps, you know, a lot with the, she, yeah, there's a new church that she's helped to help start with a team there of two, two couples. Hope Baptist Church was just started a few months ago, she helps with the children's ministry there. She also teaches in the Bible college, teaches other ladies there in the college uh, how to be able to start children's ministries. And then she helps to get them uh, started there and how to do it. And then, um, so she's been a special blessing, not only to the local church there that's just been planted uh, in Kisumu, but also to a lot of the area churches there that now send their ladies to a modular Bible college there. And she's been able to help there. And while we were there, it's very special, she also has neighborhood Bible clubs. And one of the small children she's been working with for a while got saved. Amen. So it's very special. This is little Aiden. And uh, Aiden has just been, she's been very close. Uh, he's been close with conviction. And, uh, and so he came up to her big crocodile tears. Amen. And so it's kind of special while we were there. Amen. So we, we got there on that Sunday. And Laura helped to teach with the, the children's ministry there, and they had me preaching, and uh, it was a special time. Um, my, after 10 years of being a field director back here in America, my Swahili is a little rusty, 
but the Lord helped me. I preached all the way through, uh, about a 30-minute message there, and uh, two raised your hand, responding for salvation, uh, for the need of salvation, and uh, we praise the Lord for that. Erica continued to disciple the young teenage girls there, and she was active that afternoon, teaching, and then with the children's ministry there. This is a new church plant, so they just have a small little building, just a tin. It's a basically, you know, just poles up and tin around it. Erica's Sunday school class is right next door in a welding shop, as you can tell. And uh, so that's where her Sunday school class is. And um, so they're hoping to be able to get some property soon and be able to put up their own building there for the Hope Baptist Church there in Kisumu. And then also while we were there, um, she had a daddy fix-it list. So uh, my wife has a honeydew list here. She had a daddy list there. And so we had fun. Uh, one of the things is we, we replastered one of her walls there. And uh, so that took, a, that took a little bit of time there and just redid some of her door jams and try to get everything unstuck and everything and did some plumbing work on, uh, on so forth out of her little house that she has there. And then mama and daughter had some fun. They went out and got new dresses. How about that? And uh, maybe they can wear those when they come. And there was a little uh, um, safari walk not too far from there, right there by the Lake Victoria. And we were able to just, uh, just enjoy uh, having a, an afternoon there together. My wife and I took a picture, but something photobombed us in this picture. I don't know why. Um, but, uh, but anyhow. But uh, just pray for Erica. She is just really really enjoys her life there and of course we we enjoyed our 20 years that the lord gave us there in east africa and she just loves what the lord is doing there through her and we're so proud of her and um just continue to pray for her as she ministers for the lord there after glasses brother i don't know if you need those oh that's your glasses you may need them you're getting a little older aren't you brother you, you may need you may need those. Amen. You know, Brother David sang that old song without any words right here. He just, uh, that's, that's pretty impressive, actually, <laughs> anymore. All right, well, let's take our Bibles, please, and turn to the epistle of Jude, uh, the book before Revelation. As the young people are dismissed <laughs> to the youth fellowship, I tried, to, I tried to hold them in here, but he, he got up and took them out. Anyway, I know they enjoyed that, too. Well, we're continuing our study through the New Testament. We're on our way to the book of the Revelation, and uh, that'll take us some time, I'm sure, once we begin that study. Uh, we've never studied through the book of the Revelation, and so that will be interesting. I think it'll tie in with our studies on Wednesday night as well. But for the meantime, we're going through the book of Jude, and you will remember that Jude is the servant of Jesus Christ, the brother of James, but he's actually also the half-brother of Jesus. And this James, who wrote the epistle of James, was the pastor of the church in Jerusalem, not the apostle James, as James and John, uh, but these were the half-brothers of, of Jesus, the, uh, the sons of Joseph and Mary, and uh, they're mentioned for us in the scriptures. Now, we saw last time that Jude was uh, going to write a doctrinal letter about our common salvation, but he changed his mind. He wrote about the contending for the faith because the faith was under attack. And just like Second John and Third John, there was a reason uh, why he wrote this epistle. There was a sense of urgency. There was danger uh, concerning the false teachers. And, of course, we saw some of that falsehood in Second John and then also uh, Diotrephes in Third John as well. Well, uh, we're going to read from verse 4 to verse 8. Uh, but I think actually it would be worthwhile just reading from verse 1 through verse 8. So let's go ahead and do that as we start here in Jude, verse number 1. Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to them that are sanctified by God the Father and preserved in Jesus Christ and called, mercy unto you and peace and love be multiplying. Beloved, when I give all diligence to write, unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. For there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, 
ungodly men, turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness, and denying the Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. I will therefore put you in remembrance, though ye once knew this, how that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed them that had believed not. Uh, them that believe not. Verse 6, And the angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness unto the judgment of the great day. Even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh, are set forth as an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Likewise, also these filthy dreamers defile the flesh, despise dominion, and speak evil of dignities. Now, Father, help us to understand the writings of Jude, and we pray, Lord, that you'll help us in our day to take warning, and Lord, that you will prepare us to earnestly contend for the faith, which we know was once delivered unto the saints, never to be repeated, never to be added to. Uh, we have all that you've given to us. Help us, Lord, to receive the baton of the responsibility of propagating the word of God, but also, Lord, defending it and uh, contending and struggling for it uh, in our generation. So, Lord, bless us and help us tonight, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, um, we now move on to verse number four. And, of course, we're coming back to what he said in verse 3, when he said, It was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith. Now, the word contend, we saw, is that has this idea of struggling, where you've got to put every energy into um, opposing the enemy as you're wrestling and struggling and contending and fighting earnestly for the faith, which was once delivered. That means once for all. It was once for all. Uh, delivered, not to be added to again. And the first word in verse number four is very important. This is the reason why we are to earnestly contend. This is the reason why we should be willing to struggle and to stand for the truth and defend the truth. Verse four, for, because. The reason we need to stand is because there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men, turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, he's going to go on through the most of this epistle, describing the apostates. We've entitled the message tonight, The Attributes of the Apostates. And he's going to use three examples here of what these, these apostates were like, um, in, uh, who were in fact in the audience that Jude was referring to and speaking to. But what we need to understand here. Uh, that there is a reason to fight because, first of all, ungodly men had already infiltrated their ranks. This is an urgent thing because it's not that these guys were coming in. They're already here. Second Peter is very like Jude, but he warns them that the, the false teachers are coming. When we come to Jude, they're already there. And they're infiltrated. Four, verse four, four. We should fight for. There are, there are certain men crept in on a worse. He says they're already there. And uh, this is really very concerning uh, to Jude. And he's really warning them about these false teachers that had infiltrated their ranks. Now, notice that little phrase there. Certain men crept in on a words. If you look over at 2 Peter uh, chapter 2, similar phrase is used in 2 Peter chapter 2 verse number 1. But there were false apostles. There were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers. Notice there shall be false teachers. We believe that Jude was written after Second Peter, although they have many of the same topics and phrases and so on. Um, so uh, even as there shall be false teachers among you who privily... Now the word privily is important. He uses the word privily uh, 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 in, in Galatians chapter of 2 and verse number 4. The word privily there um, means that it is uh, to be, it means, the word is para, which means by the side. And the the phrase that is used in Jude where it says crept in on a words, it means that they slip in by the side door. 
These people have infiltrated. They have crept in on a words. They have come in privily. Uh, according to Second Peter chapter 2, privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them. That's interesting, because these people are not saved. And yet the Bible says that they were bought by the Lord. No limited atonement uh, in that verse. Even denying the Lord that bought them and bring upon themselves swift destruction. And just as Peter, Jude is going to emphasize that these guys are under the judgment of God. Look over at Galatians. Now this is kind of, uh, we're discovering here Satan's MO, the way, he, the modus operandi, how he operates in infiltrating the church. Now on Wednesday nights we've been looking at the parables of the kingdom. And he talked about tares being sown among the wheat. He talked about the mustard seed growing unnaturally, not in the plant, but in the tree. This is a massive counterfeit system we call Christendom. And then last time we looked at the leaven, and we're going to look at it again. Uh, the second, second part of that message is coming Wednesday night. And leaven is insidious. It spreads. It's falsehood. It's evil doctrine, uh, evil actions, evil motives, evil attitudes. And uh, the work of Satan is the infiltrate. Uh, the work of God and to uh, sow that leaven among the word of God. And Paul said the same thing here in Galatians chapter 2 and verse number 4. And that because of false brethren. Now what is a false brethren? A false brother, a false sister is someone who looks like a brother, talks like a brother, but is not a brother. Uh, this would be a terror that Jesus warned about. Uh, the false prophets. And that because of false brethren, unawares. Now, unawares mean that they, they got in without anybody noticing. Brought in, who came in privily to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us in the bondage. They were the Judaizers, and they were trying to say, well, yeah, you can believe on Jesus, but you've got to be circumcised, you've got to keep the law. And that's what he's fighting against. Paul is fighting and struggling in, in the book of Galatians for the truth of the gospel. And so what, what Jude is also warning about, that these certain men have already crept in, unawares, and something that Peter warned would happen, uh, Paul experienced it happening, and uh, they've come in by the side door. Now, you know, it seems like the messages have been on this theme for some time now, but and whatever series we're in would all, always kind of end up here. Um, but it's important that the church protect itself. We talked about the pastor, the shepherd, uh, has the primary responsibility of guarding the gate. Uh, don't let the wolves in. Don't let the false brethren to come in. Now, we can't do that uh, perfectly because we can't see a person's heart. But before you can ever uh, become a member in a Baptist church, you have to give a credible profession of faith. And I, I believe this, that believers should always want to come to the church and come into the church. If uh, 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 folks are seeking to join the church, they should want to come by the front door. And what that means is they come the way we have specified. And uh, it's funny, uh, I'll just spill the beans. The loopers are they're planning to join. They were going to come this morning, and I forgot to give them the cue. So I said, well, you can come tonight if you want, but uh, well, you'll have to come forward again on Sunday morning so that everybody can shake your hand, you know. But anyway, this couple have come by the front door, and we visited with them. We have shared the church constitution and the articles of faith. We've given them extensive application, and we've, we've talked to them on different occasions. And uh, Lord willing, on Sunday, uh, they'll be coming forward to join the church, and we're very happy about that. And we extend the right hand of fellowship to them. So, um, but anyway... Uh, just stole our thunder about that, but I thought it was a good illustration of people coming by the front door, wanting to do it the right way. Now, what that means is this, is that when the, inter when the people, and you know, when people come to the church, unless there's extenuating circumstances, um, and there's a couple coming to the church right now, and they belong to another church, but that other church doesn't have, the, have a Wednesday night service, so they come here, Okay. But if a person is coming to the church here a uh, week in, a week out, month in, a month out, and I've told them to take, you know, take their time to check us out and we'll check them out. But at the end of the day, it should be that they wish to join the church. In Acts chapter 1, the number of the names was about 120 people in the upper room. They had a list. They had a church role, if you like. Maybe didn't have it written down, but they knew who they were. And they had a number of names of people 
who were in the membership of that church. Church membership is a biblical thing. In 1 Corinthians chapter 5, the man who was in sin was to be put outside the membership. Well, you can't put somebody outside unless there's an inside. And there is, there's an in and there's an out. And the only way you can do that is with a membership. And so when you come to join the church, you have to give, you have to come by the front door. You have to give the membership of that church and the leadership of that church an opportunity to make yourself available that they would have an opportunity to scrutinize what you believe. Do we believe the same things? That's why that people who are seeking to join the church are given the uh, articles of faith. They're asked to read them. They're asked to affirm that they believe what's in there and that they were on the same page. And if they're not on the same page, then they need to go find a church where they are on the same page because they have to come by the front door and also a report of their conduct. And so there has to be somewhat of a vetting process. The church has always did this. And, you know, you remember me speaking about the Apostle Paul and how that uh, the church wasn't going to receive him at all except Barnabas vouched for him because they were guarding the gain. These guys didn't come by the gate. They didn't come by the front door. They came by the side door. That's what that means. The slip in privily by the side door, uh, on notice, unawares, coming in and acting like they're part of the fellowship and yet were never uh, scrutinized concerning their doctrine. And now we find out that they're in the church assembly already. And the leadership of the church here has not done due diligence. Uh, these men have crept in unawares. Now, of course, what he's going to say is, this is a very serious thing, and these men are heading for judgment. In verse 4, he goes on to say, who were before of old ordained to this condemnation. Now, that's not to say that these men were predestined to be ungodly men, that these men were predestined for hell and for judgment. No, that was their choice. Ungodliness is a personal choice. To be ungodly, they had to choose to be ungodly. But what this is saying is that God knew that they were coming. In fact, Peter warned us, he prophesied that they were coming, who were before of old ordained to this condemnation. You put yourself in this bracket, and God's got a place, he's got a destination for you. And so God foretold of them and their judgment. Look at verse 14. And Enoch also the seventh from Adam prophesied of these, saying, Behold, the Lord God cometh with ten thousand of his saints. That's at the second coming. By the way, that's us that's coming back with him. In verse 15, to execute judgment upon all and to convince all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds, which they have ungodly committed and of all their hard speeches, which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. And in verse four, it says, uh, ungodly men. And this is the condemnation that God has set for these. They're predestined for judgment if they continue in this vein. Now, I think there's um, somewhat of uh, an advice to the uh, believers here. Um, and he ends with a very compassionate note in verse 22. And if some have compassion, making a difference, and others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire. These apostates are going into the fire. And I'll tell you what, it's going to be very, very difficult to uh, grab a hold of them and make any kind of difference. But he ends with that note of compassion and, and with fear that we reach in, that these people are going to hell and we're trying to pull them out of the fire. And so he's trying to reach them. But he's, you know, I think Jude is actually trying to reach them because many of them would actually read this and see the warning uh, that is coming, uh, that these, the judgment that's coming. And so uh, this is the condemnation on godly men. Turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness. Now, these were ungodly men. This is a wicked lifestyle. Turning the grace into lasciviousness. Grace is, well, we know what that is. It's God's mercy and grace and benevolence and love and his giving to us what we don't deserve. And mercy is not giving to us what we do deserve. Um, and we have received grace. We're saved by grace the benevolence of God, the favor of God, and the enablement of God, and God's grace standing between us and the judgment we deserve. But because of that, they've taken the, the message of grace and they've twisted it into something that's, that's, that, that's not so, that's not true. They've turned the grace of God, of our God, into lasciviousness. Now, lasciviousness is unbridled, unrestrained lust. 
And it's kind of like the, these people get the idea, well, when you get saved and you're forever saved, then you have a license to sin. That's a wrong idea completely. Yeah. If you have tasted of the grace of God, it does something in you. You've been regenerated on the inside, and you cannot be the same, you can't have the same relationship to sin that you did before you were saved. And uh, these people had heard about this message, but they hadn't received this message truly. And they turned it into a message of lasciviousness. In other words, unbridled, unrestrained lust, which will be kind of illustrated in the, um, these three examples that he's going to share here in just a moment. So these are ungodly men. These are wicked men. These are men who are involved in unbridled, unbridled unrestrained sin. They certainly thought that they had a license to sin. And with that ungodliness came their doctrine. It says, continuing in verse 4, And denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Their evil lifestyle was accompanied by their evil theology. You know, what you believe will affect how you behave. There's no doubt about that. And their theology was one of, a den of denial. Denying the, Lord, the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. The essential truths about God and of Christ, his person and his work, are denied. He's God in the flesh. We don't believe that. He was virgin born. We don't believe that. He died his work, his vicarious work on the cross. He died for sinners. He took the, sin, he took the penalty for our sin that we may go through, free. We don't believe that. They denied everything about the Lord, who he was and what he did. And so their lifestyle was ungodly and their theology was also ungodly. Denying the only Lord God. Now in verse number five, he says, I will therefore put you in remembrance, though ye once knew this. Somehow, these believers understood these important truths, but somehow they had forgotten those things. Peter says the same thing. I'm going to put you in remembrance, though you know them. And uh, I want you to be, you know, we often forget things that are important. And he says, let me remind you of some things. These people, uh, as he goes on to say, he says, these people are already among you. They've already crept in. Uh, look at verse 12. He says, these are spots. These people, these, these ungodly men have come in on a words. They're mixing with the believers. And I'll tell you what, their sin is coming with them. And like leaven, it's going to spread and it's going to affect the rest of the believers. He says, these are spots in your feasts of charity. When they feast with you, feeding themselves without fear. You know, the agape uh, meal that they would have usually after the Lord's Supper. Now, they must have been real Baptists, I don't know, because they, they like to eat like we like to eat. But they would have the Lord's Supper. And then afterwards, they may have a church fellowship where they have a larger meal. Uh, and everybody would, would eat together. Well, these people were there. He says, there's spots in your face. They're, they're the odd ones out. They're, they're goats in the midst of the, of the flock of God. And they feast with you, feeding themselves without fear, without reverence, without any kind of humility. And you could just imagine if they're unrestrained, if they were teaching lasciviousness, they were unrestrained in everything that they did. Clouds they are without water. In other words, they look good, they promise, they're promising, but there's no reality there, there's no water there. Carried about of winds, trees whose fruit withereth without fruit, fruit twice dead, plucked out plucked up by the roots. And what he's basically saying is they shouldn't be there. You've allowed, you've allowed them in. And they're, they're false. And they're, they're wicked. And they're unsaved. And they're lost. And I'll tell you something else. Judgment's coming to them. Look at verse, uh, uh, verse 16. He says, These are murmurers, complainers, walking after their own lusts. And their mouth speaketh great swelling words. So these people are very smooth talkers. They're very charismatic people. They have uh, outstanding personalities. And then it says, having men's persons in admiration. These people who were spots in their face were already admired by the believers that were there. And because of advantage, they've already placed themselves with advantage in the, the assembly. He says, I want to remind you of something, that this is, this is a problem right here. He says, I don't like to write to you about the common salvation, but this is a, this is a problem. You've got, to, you've got to get on right away. You've got to address it because you know what happened with 11? It spreads and it's going to hurt the church. Look at uh, 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 2 through 3. Again, similar here, Peter is prophesying of the, these birds that are coming. 
And in verse number two, he says, And many shall follow their pernicious ways. He's warning the church. He's warning true believers. True believers were at risk here. He says, Many of the true believers will follow their pernicious ways. By, re by reason of whom, because of the influence of these bad guys, the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. Everything that's good is going to be, be castigated as wrong, and everything that's wrong is going to be relabeled as right. Verse 3, And through covetousness, through covetousness shall they with feigned words, that's hypocritical words, make merchandise of you. You're going to spoil the church. They're going to get as much as they can out of you, whether it's money or favors or um, position or whatever it might be. They're going to make merchandise of you. And then he says, whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not, and their damnation slumbereth not. And Jude is going to reflect what Peter says here um, in, in his chapter about this, that judgment is coming to these people. And again, if you look down at verse, uh, uh, verse 23 there, he says, others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire. They're going for judgment. They're going to judgment. So now, that's kind of the introduction and then he starts by likening uh, these. If you look at verse 8, he kind of ties what he's going to say in verse 5 through verse 7. And he ties it together in verse 8. And he applies these three examples to these bad people. And he says, likewise, the, also these filthy dreamers. They're going to have, if the heat's on or if the cool's on. So the cool's on. Shouldn't, be, shouldn't cool it down too much. But I see someone in the back row and they're doing this. So I take that as a good excuse to get into it. Okay. All right. Well, let's go to the end of verse number five. Here's the first example. The attributes of the apostates. What are these apostates like? Well, they're like something that he mentions here in verse number five. First of all, they're like Israel. Lost Israel. Verse five, I will therefore put you in remembrance, though you once knew this, how that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, Afterward, destroyed them that believed not. And of course, this is during the Exodus. And really, when the 12 spies went into the promised land, and 10 came back with a bad report, 2 came back with a good report, Caleb and Joshua. And Caleb and Joshua were the only ones that were over the age of 19 years old that got to go into the land. The rest of that gen the old, older generation, God would not let them to go in. Why? Because of their unbelief. And so these apostates, number one, are unbelieving. That's why they're apostates. Apo means away from the faith. And we said, uh, I don't know when it was last week or week before, that apostates, um, by the very nature of the word apostate, come from Christianity, from Christendom, from association with Christians. You know, uh, Hindus are not apostates. Uh, Muslims are not apostates. Apostates are people who have identified with the Christian faith and then went away from it. Right. Now the question is, well, were they ever saved? And the answer is, no, they were never saved. Just like we said this morning, people could be disciples of the Lord and yet not believers in the Lord. And that's what happened here with the Israelites. He says, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, that's the Exodus, afterward destroyed them that believed not. Well, let's see what the Bible says about that. Look at uh, Hebrews chapter 3. Hebrews chapter 3. It's been quite a, uh, I guess, a few years since we went through the book of Hebrews. It was a very important study. I learned a lot through the book of Hebrews. The book of Hebrews is written to Hebrew Christians. Uh, people who professed in Christ, who came from a Jewish background. And you know, when they did that, many of them came out, um, you know, Jewish people are very, they're very clannish, very insular. Um, and so if, uh, if, if, if the Apostle Paul or Paulus comes into their, their synagogue and preaches the gospel, many of them will believe. And some whole synagogues would have turned to the Lord uh, like they did at Berea. Um, but the problem with that is, is when you have a whole community that turns to the Lord and Together they believe on Christ and receive him as their Messiah and receive them as their Savior. And most of them are probably genuinely saved. But some of them come along with the crowd. And really that's who's Paul, uh, well, Paul or whoever the author is of Hebrews. Um, uh, that's who he's talking to. He's talking to people who went along with their moms and dads and everybody else in the synagogue. Uh, but now they've got this choice at some point in their life here. They're faced with a choice. 
Do I continue on to believe upon Christ? Or do I go back to the old ways of Judaism? And the author of Hebrews is giving argument after argument after argument why not to go back. Okay? Um, and if you pick up in Hebrews chapter 3 verse 16, he says, For some, when they had heard, did provoke, howbeit not all that came out of Egypt by Moses. Now, he's using this illustration of the Exodus. That there were people that came out, they escaped, they escaped Egypt. But they didn't go into the promised land. They escaped the pollutions of the world, but they were truly not saved in their own hearts. And they didn't receive eternal life. They escaped Pharaoh, but they didn't get eternal life. Verse 17, but with whom was he grieved 40 years? Was it not with them that had sinned, whose carcasses fell in the wilderness? And to whom swore he that they should not enter into his rest, but to them that believed not? So we see that they could not enter in because of their own belief. And by the way, uh, right, the Lord sent a plague uh, to the, the spies that came back. You know, they didn't even hang around. God killed them. You know, they would have, they would have been better believing God and going in to fight the giants than having to fight God and lose. But the scriptures I want you to see is in verse four, chapter 4. He says, Let us therefore fear, lest a promise being left us of entering into his rest any of you should seem to come short of it. Now, he's addressing people collectively, but in that collective group, there are people who are not seen. They have come out of Judaism, but they have not entered into rest. Now, what does he mean by rest? Look at verse 2. He says, For unto us was the gospel preached, as well as unto them. But the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. For we which have believed do enter into rest. It's kind of like what Paul says in, the, in Romans chapter 4 verse 5. But on the him which worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted unto him for righteousness. If you look down at verse 9, he says, There remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. For he that has entered into his rest, he also hath ceased from his own works, as God did from his. Let us labor, therefore, to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. Now, the point is, they didn't get in because of unbelief, and they perished. And it's an illustration of what it is, I think, a great illustration for the, the people that Hebrews has written to. But also what he's talking about here in Jude is that some people have come so far. You know, if you get a Jewish person uh, to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, that he is the Christ, that he is the Son of God, that's a wonderful thing. And you've brought him from unbelief to intellectual belief in who Jesus is. But that's kind of like Nicodemus. He's, Nicodemus says, we believe that you're from God. No man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with them. And so intellectually he'd come from unbelief to belief, but he wasn't saved yet. And really, if you get a Jewish person to come from where he is, to believe in that Jesus is the Son of God, that's basically where you were before you got saved. Because, you know, basically from our culture, my culture, I believe Jesus was the Savior. I believe he was the Son of God. But I wasn't saved yet because it was up here. Right. And so you can come so far, but you have to go the rest of the way. And the rest of the way is where you take your soul and you rest your soul in him. Where you stop all this working, like Philippians 3, where Paul gives his testimony. The things that were gained to me, I count it lost. Be found in him that have my own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ. Look over at 2 Peter chapter 2 again, please, if you would. And I want you to see this because Peter's dealing with the same issues here. In 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse number 20, he also is speaking about the apostates. And he says similar things in verse 17. These are wells without water, clouds that are carried with a tempest, to whom is mid the midst of darkness is reserved forever, always emphasizing the judgment of the coming. But in verse 20, he says, For if after they have escaped, it, who's they? It's the apostates. If after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of, of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled therein and overcome. The latter end is worse with them than with the beginning. For it is better... Uh, being better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than after they have known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them. So they knew about the commandment. They knew what they had to do to get saved, but they turned from it. But in the process of going from one place to the next place, 
They can say no to the world. They can identify with Christianity. And they can escape the corruptions that are in the world. Churches are filled with people who are unsaved. Yet it's kind of like what I was talking about today. Worshippers of God come to the church every Sunday. And because they're following the teachings of Christ about morality. They're escaping a lot of the sin and the hurt and the damage. And the corruption that is in the world. They escape all of that. But they're still not saved. And that was true of Israel. And it's true of the apostates. And why are they still in trouble? Because they are unbelieving. They will not believe. You can believe it intellectually. You come to this place. But the thing that saves is when you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. When you take your faith and trust. You place it in him. When you lie back on him in his mercy and grace. When you find the rest of God. You take your rest in him. You work not. Um, that's what he says in Hebrews chapter 4. There, there remaineth therefore a rest of the people of God. But if you're still trying to work your way. Then you'll never find that rest. And you're not saved. And the apostates have never come to that place. And they were not saved. They are not saved. And so let's go back to uh, Jude for again for a moment. And we'll notice the next one. So he's saying they're like... The is, like Israel as they come out in the Exodus, they escape some things. They identified with Moses. Um, in fact, they identified with Moses as they came through the Red Sea. I think it's First Corinthians ten. They were all baptized on the Moses. They were identified in Moses, but they still didn't believe, and they never got to the Promised Land. The second example is in verse number six, and the angels which kept not their first estate but left their own habitation, he hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness unto the judgment of the great day. Notice that this always emphasizes judgment all the way through. I think he knows that these guys are going to be reading this or they're going to be a, a, a confronted with these truths. And God in his mercy and through Jude, he's, he's still trying to reach them. But these are uh, like the angels. In verse number six is speaking about the angels. And so apostates are unbelieving. Number two, apostates are unrestrained. Apostates are unrestrained. Now, this is a very tricky uh, passage uh, with others in 1 Peter and other places. Uh, verse 6 is helping us to understand that the angels at the beginning when they were created were given a special domain. The Bible talks about principalities and powers. Uh, there were certain responsibilities that all angels had. And we know that there's at least one falling of the angels that fell with Satan. And they would be the evil spirits, the demons that are able to possess men uh, during Jesus' time, even today too. Not saved people, but unsaved people. And uh, Satan is walking about like a roaring lion. And I think he has principalities and powers and darkness uh, that control many of the things that happen in this world. But this is a special situation with these angels because these angels right now are not roaming the earth. Now, I'll give you a heads up. Some people believe that in Genesis chapter 6, the sons of God, uh, which is a very credible definition for angels, that they came uh, to the daughters of men. They took wives of men and had sexual relationship with those women and children were born to them. And there's a very popular uh, teaching and some very good men hold to that. Some of my best preacher friends hold to that um, doctrine. Now we've kind of discussed this before. My view is I don't I don't go along with that. Um, I don't believe that angels are able to um, procreate with uh, the seed of Adam and our DNA. I just I just can't put those thing, two things together. So uh, I just I can't follow that. Um, some people will say, well, this is in reference to those angels that fell uh, before Noah uh, when that, that was going on. Again, I don't accept that. But from these verses, what it does say is that there was a class of angels that kept not their first estate. And whether that was uh, in relationship to the fall of Satan or something different, we're not, um, we can't really be sure about that because the Bible is silent about it. Um, but they certainly left their... Uh, kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation because of that dissatisfaction, that, that rebellion, uh, that, that unrestrained. It's kind of like there's boundaries, boundaries. 
and they would, they would not live within the boundaries. These angels had wonderful um, privileges and, and powers and responsibilities that God gave to them, but God had very definite bounds on what they could do and what they could not do, and those angels stepped over those bounds. They were unrestrained. And so they went beyond the boundaries. Because of that, in verse 6, it says, He hath reserved an everlasting chains under darkness unto the judgment of the great day. And so these, these, speci these this special class of uh, angels and the special rebellion that is mentioned here, these ones are not roaming the earth. These ones are in chains in hell, waiting for the judgment of the great day. Well, let's look at Second Peter chapter 2, because he alluded to this as well. In Second Peter chapter 2, um, in verse number 4, he says, For if God spurred not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell, and delivered them in the chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment. And you know, I think to myself, why is it that he, he keeps emphasizing, Peter did too, but Judas doing the same thing, of judgment, judgment, judgment. Is it because the people, these apostates, think that there's no consequences for their actions? Could it be that the believers who have kind of been duped into this and they're going away and they're admiring these charismatic people, that somehow they don't realize the danger and the judgment that is just ahead for these people? And he's putting them in remembrance of these things. They already knew it, but somehow they've been lulled asleep about it, that there's real judgment that is coming. But the, the thing that I come away with from verse 6 is this, this, the, this idea of they were unrestrained. They wouldn't color within the lines. They wouldn't stay in their lane, bro. Okay? You know, stay in your lane. There's things that you are restrained to. But because of pride, like Satan, they basically can just step over the line. That's what apostates are like. There's no restraint to apostates. They will not follow the word of God. They will not be restrained by the word of God. They'll not be restrained by uh, true doctrine. They transgress all those things. They cross the boundaries of what the Bible teaches. Deny the faith once delivered. Transgress the law and the will of God. They violate those boundaries of authority. They're lawless. They're rule breakers. They're unrestrained. Won't stay in their lane. By the way, when they come into a church like this, they'll, not be able, they'll, they'll cause all kinds of problems. They'll not want to follow leadership. They'll be criticizing this and that. And why don't we do this? And there's a rebellion that is there. And it's unrestrained. They don't want to be restrained. You know, all of us are, I'm restrained. I have to be restrained in the things that I do and the things that I say and the way that I live. And all of us do in the covenant of the church that we're trying to follow the Lord and please the Lord and, and live a, 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 a life of a testimony for Christ. They're not concerned about that. And uh, they'll do whatever they want when they want it. Doesn't matter what the church teaches, doesn't matter what the church believes, doesn't matter what the pastor says or what the, the trustees or the, the rules of the road that we would have in the running of the church. No, they would be unrestrained. They don't want to stay in their lane. They'll be in your lane. And they'll be in my lane. <laughs> That's one of their attributes. Apostates are unbelievers. And apostates are unrestrained. Number three, apostates are unnatural in verse number seven. Even as Sodom and Gomorrah. And the cities about them, in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh, are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Always comes back to judgment. But he uses Sodom and Gomorrah as an example of apostates. As the angels crossed the boundaries and were unrestrained, so in like manner Sodom and Gomorrah crossed the natural boundaries, giving themselves over to fornication, sexual immorality, and strange flesh. And we don't need to go into all of that. We know exactly what that is. But it was unrestrained. And even nature, does not even nature teach you, the Bible says, and in Romans chapter 1, they go against nature, going after strange flesh this is not in the design and plan of God but they don't care about that because they don't believe they're unbelieving and they're unrestrained and that leads to things that are unnatural now you think about this theological liberalism goes hand in hand with the LGBT homosexual agenda 
I mean, think about it. Every time you see them on the news and they've got these uh, gay pride things, they'll have... And by the way, usually the ministers are ladies. Have you ever noticed that? They got the ladies and they're dressed in the rainbow stuff and all that. And they've got, they always have to have the little, white, the little white collar on. See, that goes with what I was saying last Wednesday night. About the woman hiding the leaven in the three measures of meal. And theological liberalism goes hand in hand. It could be that uh, theological liberals may be personally guilty of homosexuality or things that are beyond nature or um, beyond those natural boundaries. But I'll tell you what, even if they're not guilty of it personally, they certainly encourage others to do so. And so you have homosexuals being ordained into the ministry. It's all about the fact that they want you to accept them. They're looking for your approval. And they can't have that because they don't have God's approval. And that's where the rub is. But they cross the boundaries of what is natural. And apostates are unbelieving. And they're unrestrained. And they're unnatural. And then in verse 8, and I've got to hurry. He ties us all together. By saying in verse 8 that apost apostates, I almost said apostles, apostates are uninhibited. You see, unnatural and being uninhibited go hand in hand. Because not only do you have homosexuality, you have homosexuality. I mean, when you think of pride, you just think of the word, they've corrupted the word pride. Although pride's not a good thing anyway. But they, they've corrupted the word pride in our, in our vocabulary. So when you think of pride or a pride parade, it's always got to do with homosexuality. You see, they're not just happy to be unnatural. They also want to be uninhibited. And they have these gay pride periods. And what, I mean, you, you see them on television, on the news and stuff. You can't watch them. In fact, there was a bill recently introduced um, uh, up in Washington uh, that said that these, um, uh, what do you call these people who go into the, the, nurse, or into the libraries? The drag queens, right? But see, some of these drag queens are dressed very pr pr provocatively. There's nudity at these, uh, these gay pride things. These people are running around and they've no clothes on. And they're involved in, if it's not sexual acts uh, in public, it's very, very close to it. And they're indecent and they're uninhibited in all that they do. Those things go hand in hand. And we're, we see it on the news. We see it in the newspapers even in our day. It's an, it's an amazing thing. It's a sad thing that this is where we're at today. So in verse 8, he says, Likewise... So just like Israel, just like uh, the angels, just like Israel that didn't believe, and the angels that um, uh, were unrestrained, and Sodom and Gomorrah that were unnatural, likewise also these filthy... He's talking about the apostates that are going to hear this. These false, these filthy dreamers defile the flesh, despise dominion, and speak evil of dignities. Now, I don't know if you've noticed this or not, but he just did a conclusion on those three verses, but he did it in reverse order. Yeah. Let me show you what I'm talking about. First of all, he says, likewise, these, also these filthy dreamers defile the flesh. Well, defiling the flesh goes back to verse 7 with Sodom and Gomorrah. These apostates are just like the Sodomites. They have no moral code. If there is a right and wrong, they're rebelling against it anyway. So if it's wrong, they're probably going to go for it. They defile the flesh. Filthy dreamers. It starts in the mind and then it's acted out in reality. And then he says, um, they despise dominion. Well, that's the angels. That's verse 6. They reject the boundaries. They despise any kind of control, dominion, being told what to do. Who's God to tell us what to do? We will do what we want. And the angels left their first estate, their first habitation. And they rebelled. They were unrestrained. They would not restrain themselves. They wouldn't uh, allow themselves to be governed or controlled. And apostates are just like that. They despise dominion. They despise any control. They're anarchists. They don't want anybody governing them or telling them what to do. Who are you to tell me that Jesus is gone? Who are you to tell me that I'm not supposed to do this? Who are you to say that homosexuality is a bad thing? When people love each other, then what can be wrong with that? They despise dominion. And then they speak evil of dignities. Now that goes back to verse 5. You see, he does this in reverse order. You divide the flesh like Sodom and Gomorrah. You despise dominion like the angels. And you speak evil of dignities like Israel in the wilderness. Well, who was that? 
Will you remember Israel in the wilderness? They refused to believe God. And, and uh, some of them spoke against God. They murmured. Like he says in verse 16, these are murmurers and complainers. And that's what got the children of Israel into trouble. That's why the poisonous snakes came and the brazen snake had to be made. Whosoever would look upon it would be healed because there were murmurs and complainers. But not only that, they spoke against God and against Moses. In number 16, you're introduced to a guy called Korah. And interestingly, he mentions it in verse number 11. Woe unto them, for they've gone in the way of Cain and ran up greedily after the heir of Balaam and for reward and perished in the gain saying of Korah. The gain saying of Korah. Gain saying is contradicting. It is standing against. And the story in number 16 is that Korah comes before Moses and he says, you're taking too much on yourself. These are godly people. These people belong to the Lord. Moses, who do you think you are? You know, Moses, that he fell on his face before God. There wasn't a meeker man on all the earth than Moses. A man of humility. You know why Moses was the leader? Because God made him the leader. He ran from it. He didn't want it. He didn't want the job. But God chose him for it. He wasn't in it for notoriety. So this guy, he did want notoriety. And sticking his finger in Moses' face. And he's, 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 he's despising um, not only dominion, but he's speaking evil of dignities. See, apostates have no problem um, castigating uh, true um, Christian writers and philosophers and preachers and believers who believe the Bible, they'll, they'll castigate you all day long and love every minute of it, speaking evil of dignities, just like Korah. But you remember what happened with Korah? Moses stood up and he said, I'm going to tell you something. If you die like everybody else is going to die, then I'm not a man of God. I'm not a prophet of God. But if God does something that he's never done before and the whole earth opens up and swallows you alive and your families and all of you together and you go down into hell alive, he says, then people will know that you're wrong and I am the leader that God has chosen. And he just got through telling them that. You know what happened? The earth opened up. And he, and he warned me, he says, get away from this guy. Get away from him. And there was 250, I think, that had the censors that they were burning uh, uh, the, 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 the smoke. And all of them were, were judged. But Korah and his whole family, God judged them and cast them into hell alive. And that's not there for just the story. That's for our example. We have to be very careful about those in government. And, uh, you know, Brother Eric said at the first of the year, you know, do you pray for President uh, Biden? And you might think, well, he's not my president. And he's a terrible president, but he's still our president. And we are supposed to pray for kings and all their authority. The Christians in their day, they had to pray for, for, the, for, uh, for Nero and uh, for the, 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 the Roman emperors. I mean, that, uh, I mean, Biden's bad, but he's not that bad. You see, God is a God of order and he's a God of authority. And we were talking just last week about, about women not speaking in the churches and so on because, and women not being um, in authority, usurping authority over the men. The men are to be the leaders. You're, you men are supposed to be the leaders in your home. You understand that? That's not an option. God has given you that responsibility. I am the head of my wife. And you are the head of your wife. Read it in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. God is a God of order. And we are under Christ. And Christ is under God. There's a hierarchy of authority. And God is a God of order. Same thing in the church. And so if you speak evil of dignities, that's what the apostates do. They're uninhibited. Uninhibited. They don't care. They'll say anything, do anything. They don't play by the rules. They're apostates. And so the conclusion, I've went on the way too long. The conclusion, he says, just par for the course. I'm sorry. I try, I'm, I'm talking as fast as I can go, you know. I like my brother, Pluto. He prayed for me, the Lord gave me, um, was it umption or something? Or oomph? <laughs> I, I need a lot of oomph. And I, the older I get, the more oomph I need. But these apostates are just like the rebels of old. That's a Jude saying. Hey, this is nothing new. There's a whole litany, there's a whole, there's a whole example in the Old Testament of the rebels of old. And what he's basically saying as we close is this, don't join them. Don't be affected by them. It's like Peter says. Many will follow their pernicious ways. Don't be one of them. Don't be duped by these guys. Don't be given the admiration, verse 16. Don't be given them advantage, verse 16. Don't be following their, their evil ways. Don't join them. Rebuke them. Stand up, defend, struggle. 
contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. And then I think amazingly, toward the end of the book, he's saying, try to reach them. Now, you've got to be very careful about it. Of some have compassion, making a difference. Where there's breath in a body, there's, there's hope. But then he says, and others save with fear. And I think you have to fear for yourself. When you're reaching under the fire, you better be careful you don't get pulled in too, in the, in the sense that judgment could come to you if, you if you get affected by them. You reach them with fear, but you want to pull them out of the fire. It's like the last ditch attempt because these guys have went so far. You know, maybe there's, there's hope if there's still breath in their bodies. But you've got to be very careful. But I think he closes with that compassion there because judgment is coming for these guys. You've got to be aware of that. You've got to know that. And so... He's going to continue, we'll continue looking at what else he says in verse 9 and following as we go through the rest of this. But it's a very serious, serious situation, an urgent situation that Jude is um, addressing here. And you know what? This is, this is just as up to date as tomorrow's newspaper. On the religious scene, on the church scene, what's going on in Christianity today, this is right up our street. We need this. And we got it, you know, this, and, and you know, I know that we're probably, we're probably, if anybody listens to these sermons online and stuff, we're probably already blackballed. Phyllis is already a troublemaker. He's not, he doesn't want to get together. He's not an ecumenicalist. He doesn't want to get all the churches together. They're all, all by their own. I don't care. Our, our job is to follow the Bible. Amen. We've got to be right. And I'll tell you, it's every, the flow, we're going against the flow. Because the world's going this way and we're going that way. But we're doing it because it's what the Bible says. And that needs to be your conviction as well as mine. Because we need to do this together. So let's turn in our songbooks. We're going to close with a song and then we'll pray. Number 571.